Okay, folks, so just to um, formally introduce myself, I'm Caroline Cody. I'm the Assistant Director for Social Care at the Council for Disabled Children. And today we're going to talk to you about um, really understanding what we mean by deprivation of liberty and restrictions of liberty for children and young people with SEND and the implications of the forthcoming liberty protection safeguards, which hopefully many of you will be aware of. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a, um, a tool that we've been developing to support local authority areas to um, prepare for implementation of the, um, uh, the, the safeguards when they come into force. So um, just key things that we're going to look at are around um, the specific changes that are set out in the Mental Capacity Amendment Act 29 and what, how they affect young people from 16 to 25 and their families. Understanding links to the Children and Families Act and the Care Act for young people with SEND and thinking about the practical implications then for those of you who are supporting young people. Hi, Louise. Oh, all right. I'm so sorry. Could, it, could everyone just pop themselves on mute you if they're not on mute already? Let me just <laughs> pop people on mute. OK, there we go. Um, right. So I'm going to turn my camera off now, folks, just because I can already see my video lagging a bit. So I want to make sure that you can hear what I'm saying when I'm talking through the slides and that that stays um, high quality. So I'm going to turn my camera off now and then get going into the content. OK, if anyone has any problems with any of the tech, just pop a note in the chat and I'll try and help out where I can. So I wanted to start off just by talking a little bit about a piece of work that we did recently um, that I just wanted to draw your attention to, which is called Tomorrow's Leaders, A World Beyond Disability. And this was a publication and the link uh, will be in the slides that we sent out to everyone after the session. Um, and it was a piece of work that we did um, funded by the Department for Education in partnership with the Education and Training Foundation. Um, and the publication is called Tomorrow's Leaders, A World Beyond Disability. And it's a publication which profiles the achievements of over 30 um, disabled young people who are leading in their communities with ambition, hard work and dedication to improving society. And they are leading across a whole range of different areas, whether that's sport, employment, arts, um, and really kind of uh, a new piece of work that we're starting to build on at the moment is a mentoring programme where we're working with some of those uh, leaders who were uh, kind of profiled in the publication to actually support them to share their skills and experiences with other young people who are currently in college and FE coming through um, and thinking about their future employment opportunities at the moment. I just wanted to share a few of the quotes from some of the young adults who were involved in the programme, um, just to kind of um, get us thinking about young people and, and what we, we are aspiring to for them and what they are aspiring to for themselves. So the first one is that everyone should feel wanted, valued and part of something special. There's a place for everyone in the community. Never be ashamed of being different. It is this difference that makes you extraordinary and unique. Another young person would like to pass on to younger people the empowering possibilities of working in disability whilst disabled and owning your identity to empower you to succeed. We offer a unique perspective on inclusion and our voices are needed to shape the future of education and care. Another young person wants to encourage young disabled people to aspire to become elite athletes by not placing limits on themselves and by feeling confident to ask teachers and coaches to have high expectations of them and to create opportunities for them to compete. So I just wanted to have a quick um, think through and a quick activity now just to think about the importance of choice and how some of the restrictions and deprivations that we might talk about later in the session can have an impact um, on the way that, that young people feel and the way that we'll feel. And I guess that over the last year and a half, we've probably all experienced a lot more restriction than we might have done previously. And so might feel a bit closer to this topic, um, you know, than we might have done. So I would just like everyone um, to just pop a note into the um, the chat box of what you had for lunch today. Okay, porridge. Yes, the slides will be available afterwards. So we've got latte, we've got leaves and olive oil, soup, tuna mayo sandwiches. So quite a big variety, some gluten-free macaroni and cheese, rice cake, cheese toasties, roasted veg, ham salad sandwiches, banana sandwich. Wow, that's a rarity. I don't think I've ever had a banana sandwich. 
jacket potato and tuna, tomato soup, tuna cheese melt. Okay, so um, lots of different selections in there. So now I want you to imagine that you have got the lunch of the person who posted before you in the chat box, or if you were the first person who posted, the person who posted next to you. So imagine if you'd had to have that other person's lunch, what would that have felt like? Would that have worked out for you? Is it still something you like? Could there actually be some more complicated consequences of having uh, the type of food that someone else had eaten? I noticed that there's one person in there who had something that's gluten free. So maybe having something that not that's not gluten free might be more of a challenge. So any thoughts or reflections on that? Just make a note in the chat box as well. <laughs> OK, so someone's got a good choice and is just pleased it wasn't the banana sandwich. OK, happy with the latte, trying to avoid the bread. OK, so someone's a bit bored by the soup. OK, so some people happy, some people less so. Now imagine that that other person's choice is the only thing you get to have for lunch for the next two weeks and you don't get to review that choice and you don't get involved in that decision. How does that feel? Okay, so a few people saying they were bored, but it's better than nothing. So not happy about having the same choice for a couple of weeks. Bored, yeah, awful, disappointed and hungry. Groundhog, yeah, turn me off, yeah. OK, on two days, but by day three or four, it would be uh, annoying and starting to dislike it, like you're being punished and also not a balanced diet. Really good point. OK, so thanks, everyone, for participating in that. It's really helpful. Um, and, and I guess it's really just to reflect on that sometimes things that seem like small decisions or small choices can actually have quite a big impact if they're taken away from you. Um, over a long period of time or on a regular basis. Um, so some can be some real challenges. So not only challenges around our health, actually, this could be a food that we perfectly liked at the beginning of the week. But as you've said, by the end of the week, uh, you know, it's not good enough anymore. So it's just to kind of reflect on the fact that those little things and those little choices can sometimes be just as important to someone's well-being. So we're going to talk a bit now specifically about the background and the context of the Mental Capacity Amendment Act 2019 and, and the original kind of Mental Capacity Act 2005. So this act was intended to support and protect individuals in decision making. So alongside the Mental Capacity Act are deprivation of liberty safeguards or the doles, which many of you may have heard of, which are safeguards intended to protect an individual's right to liberty. So at the moment, the doles, the deprivation of liberty safeguards, apply to over 18 year olds only, even though the Mental Capacity Act 2005, which brought them uh, into force, um, applies from 16 plus. So there was a House of Lords Select Committee report in March 2014, which found that there was a widespread lack of awareness and appropriate usage of the Mental Capacity Act that the empowering ethos of the Act was really difficult to balance with the safeguarding focus and a risk averse culture that existed um, in practice. And that also in terms of the inspection frameworks, there needed to be an approach that enabled supported decision making and that it must be given an equal status with the appropriate use of deprivation of liberty safeguards or their replacement provisions, which we'll come on to shortly. So the report recommended a comprehensive review of the deprivation of liberty safeguards legislation with a view to replacing it. And then um, the Mental Capacity Act steering group, which was formed in 2013, were um, recommended to consider specific information needs of the different groups affected by the Act and regularly reviewing um, of resources and training for different audiences. Now, there's just a note in the chat about the fact that the Dole's case law takes the application of Dole's down to 12 plus, which is generally where a child or young person is, sorry, excuse my dog barking at the front door, the perils of um, online working. One moment, I'm just gonna pop her in the other room. Thank you. 
sorry, everybody. So just to pick up on some of the case law, so that... Clearly wants to take part. <laughs> I'm really sorry. No, uh, the dog it's really okay. me to tell you about the case law. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Hang it's on okay. one second. I hope you're not depriving of our liberty. <laughs> Restricting them in the room. <laughs> Locking them in a cage. Yeah. Sorry, I'll be depriving everyone in the house of their liberty in future when I, uh, I'm delivering a presentation on this topic. So I think we're 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 back on track now. So in terms of the case law, it's often um, the, the links around young people um, 12 and over are also to do with where a child is looked after. And there is a whole range of case law around 16 and 17 year olds that we won't be able to get into all of the detail of today. But I am absolutely happy to send through some links to our case law briefing um, uh, documents on our website, which have a summary of all of those different things to kind of help people unpick some of that. So we're in a 40 minute session today, which is now shorter because of my my dog's intervention so i'm gonna i'm gonna keep going but i will make sure that i send all the links through to those other aspects okay right so in terms of um restrictions and deprivations then i just wanted to share some examples because often um we don't realize the extent to which children and young people are currently being um, restricted in terms of their um, their liberty. So this is just some examples from a report um, from a couple of years ago called um, Restrict, uh, Reducing Restrictive Intervention of Children and Young People. So it was by the Challenging Behaviour Foundation and Positive and Active Behaviour Support Scotland. So in response to their survey, 88% of the 204 respondents said that their disabled child had experienced physical restraint with 35% reporting it happening regularly. 71% of families completing the survey had said that their child had experienced seclusion with 21% reporting that this was taking place on a daily basis. 50% um, of the children had been prescribed medication to manage challenging behaviour. And most of the restrictive interventions reported in the survey were taking place in schools. So, for example, 68 percent of the physical interventions were taking place in schools. Um, and then in the selection of um, case studies that were developed um, through Positive and Active Behaviour Support Scotland, 1,058 reports of restraint were included and 544 reports of seclusion. Now, when we're thinking about restrictions and deprivations of liberty for young people, it's really important to note that we're thinking about in the context of another young person the same age who does not lack capacity, who has capacity. So if we think about a 16 or 17 year old for a moment, there are a huge number of things that we might expect a young person to have access to. So for example, a uh, smartphone, the internet, access to um, uh, you know, technology that enables them to explore a whole range of different um, information online. Actually, there might be some circumstances where for all of the right reasons, um, you know, risk of online harms or things like that, we might be uh, saying that a young person or their family might be saying that they don't have a smartphone or that they don't have access to the internet. Um, actually, those things over time, when compared to another young person the same age who does not lack capacity, may be um, amounting to a, a, a long term restriction or potentially a deprivation of liberty if they were to be something that was happening over time. So it's really important to understand some of the nuances that are coming out of the case law and the developments around this work, particularly for that age group. OK. So. The Act itself, the 2019 Act, had a bit of a, a kind of interesting journey through Parliament. There were some key changes identified around responsible bodies. So um, there are hospital managers uh, for NHS hospital arrangements. CCG is a local health board where continuing health care is in place. Now, of course, that is um, continuing health care over 18 only. So there are some nuances around some of this for the 16 and 17 year olds that we're in the process of working with DFE and DHSC to unpick in the guidance and the code that will be out soon. And then the local authority is a responsible body in all other cases. So there are some conditions that need to be satisfied before arrangements can be authorised through the Liberty Protection Safeguards. And that is that the individual in question lacks capacity to consent to the arrangements that 
are being suggested that they have a mental disorder and that the arrangements are necessary to prevent harm to the individual and are proportionate in relation to the likelihood and seriousness of harm. So for me, there's something really important, and we'll talk a bit about the five principles of the Mental Capacity Act um, shortly, but there's something really important about thinking about not only do we have an, a process to identify the, where there is a deprivation of liberty, where um, there is a, um, a, a lawful kind of authorization around the liberty protection safeguards then when that's the appropriate response, but also that we have a kind of parallel plan that thinks about what are the steps we are taking to support this young person to step back from these deprivations? What are we doing to, for example, in the in the kind of uh, the, the example that I used earlier around online harms, what are we doing to support and educate that young person where possible about online harm? How are we creating and working to create the environment that enables that young person to be restricted less and less over time as part of this process? So the key recommendations of the Law Commission in relation to the liberty protection safeguards were that they should apply from 16 plus, that they can apply to more than one setting. So crucially, this is about actually all of the places where a young person might be deprived of their liberty, including in family homes, including in community settings like short break settings, as well as residential schools, colleges and also day placements in school and colleges so actually where you might have one-to-one -one support uh, long term even some of those things can amount to a deprivation of liberty which might be entirely appropriate to keep that young person safe but it's just really important that we use this process to appropriately authorize that so it's also about ensuring that these are authorised as part of planning wherever possible, rather than rubber stamping a decision already made. So there's some work that needs to happen around how do some of these planning and decision making processes align with, for example, the education, health and care planning process? How can we bring some of these conversations into annual reviews for a young person pre-16 to identify where there might be a deprivation that's likely to continue beyond 16? that a parent carer will no longer be able to consent to. And we need to have these steps in place to make sure that that young person is safeguarded around that, but also to make sure that we've got that, is this the least restrictive option conversation happening as a young person gets older. Um, it is possible in particular circumstances that a second assessment by an approved mental capacity professional can be called in to ensure uh, that the appropriate restrictions are in place and that care, care arrangements, as we've discussed, should be necessary and proportionate to the likelihood and seriousness of harm. So not all of these recommendations in their entirety have been included on the face of the Act, but the development of the guidance and the code of practice have created that opportunity to develop the safeguards further. And there will be a consultation period on the code, which is due to be launched imminently. So why are young people included from age 16? So it applies from 16. The previous dolls, as we've said, applied to adults over 18, apart from in terms of the case law where children are looked after and in various other circumstances, which I'll send the details through on. And actually what that's done is left a really confusing and challenging legal position for 16 and 17 year olds over the last few years. So we finally had some clarity around that with the Supreme Court judgment further to some kind of backwards and forwards flip flopping around appeals um, and other decisions, which is essentially that parents can no longer consent to what would otherwise be a deprivation of liberty for a 16 or 17 year old. And where a 16 or 17 year old lacks capacity to give consent to those arrangements, the current set of circumstances that that would have to go to the court of protection to be lawfully authorised. And what we also know is that that has been extremely difficult um, to manage in terms of capacity of the court of protection and there was uh, you know a significant backlog even pre um, even pre-covid and the pandemic which has also exacerbated that further so there were also some kind of initial concerns that the framework set out in the mental capacity uh, amendment, uh, what was the bill and now the act, might dilute or conflict with some of the existing safeguards that are in place for 16 and 17 year olds. And there's been a lot of work to try and unpick some of this as part of the development of the code. So we know we've got safeguards up to 18 in the Children Act 1989. We've got the Court of Protection scrutiny where parents do not consent to a doll, uh, a deprivation of liberty, which will be dealt with in future via the liberty protection safeguards. 
So understanding the role of parent carers of independent advocacy, so whether that's the, the IMCA or whether that's the AMCP that we talked about on the previous slide. And then also understanding whether we have the necessary expertise in the children's workforce to support young people and families to navigate this new legal framework. And also the commitment that we need to be um, able to ensure that there's clear, accessible information available for families, but also for practitioners. So. In terms of some of the links between the other uh, various acts, so including the Children and Families Act, the Care Act and the Mental Capacity to Act 2005. So we've already talked about the fact that the original act applied from 16, um, you know, indefinitely, but actually it's really um, clear from the work that we've done in local areas that actually there aren't as many um, children's workforce practitioners that have been involved in this. So often it's just been something that happens kind of by default from 16 and isn't always picked up on in the way it should have been. Um, so in terms of what mental capacity is, it is the ability to make a decision based on a single decision at a single time. So actually, we must start having conversations and particularly where bigger decisions are concerned for young people, how we break those decisions down into smaller decisions, into their constituent parts that let us consider actually what are the bits of this decision a young people might have capacity to make and what are the bits of this decision that actually they lack capacity to make and we need to be looking at alternative mechanisms. So, for example, if we're thinking about a young person who needs to make a decision about what college they're going to go to, um, we've got a young person post 16 who now has a right within their, um, their education, health and care plan to be able to name the institution. Um, actually, what is it that they can make that decision? What, what bits of that decision, sorry, can they make? And what bits of that decision may they not have capacity to make? So an example might be that a young person could have capacity to decide that they want to study a particular subject or a particular course. They might have capacity to decide that they want to stay near their home or stay in their family home and go to day college. But what they may not have capacity to do is weigh up all the different local college options and the level of um, kind of expertise they have in that particular subject or in meeting that child or young person's particular needs. So how do we kind of break those decisions down into those smaller parts? So I'm just going to run through the kind of five key principles of the Mental Capacity Act here. So the first principle is that it should be assumed that everyone can make their own decisions unless it's proved otherwise. So we shouldn't be assuming that just because a young person has a special educational need, a learning disability or any other kind of disability, that they can't make their own decisions unless we have taken all of the practical steps to support them to make that decision. So that's kind of principles one and two are kind of interlinked to each other. Principle three is a really important one for me. So a person should not be treated as lacking capacity just because they make an unwise decision. Now, I don't know about you guys. I made lots of unwise decisions when I was uh, an adolescent and uh, a teenager. I absolutely uh, didn't always make the right choices. But I guess what's crucial for me about our work with young people, particularly young people with learning needs, is how do we support them to go through that process after they make an unwise decision to think about what they might do differently next time and how they make different judgments in the future. And some of those things uh, are things that we would have done kind of on autopilot when we were younger. We would have gone through that process to think through what is important, what, you know, why, why did we do that? What would we think about and how would we take that experience with us into our future decisions that we might make? And then principle four and five are linked specifically to young people or, or to, to people generally, but in this context, young people who have already been found to lack capacity to make the specific decision in question. So this is that actions or decisions carried out on behalf of someone who lacks capacity must be in their best interests. Um, and on our website, one of the links that I'll send you out with the materials um, includes a, a decision making toolkit, which runs right through a, a kind of series of activities that you can go through with young people to support them to develop decision making skills and to think through what that looks like. But also goes right through into a breakdown of the best interest decision making checklist from the code of practice that you can actually go through with a young person in partnership to enable them to bring in as many of their views, feelings um, and opinions around decisions that are being made on their behalf. 
And then the fifth one is around what I mentioned earlier, this that actions or decisions carried out on behalf of someone who lacks capacity should limit their rights to freedom of action as little as possible. So how are we challenging ourselves to look at the least restrictive approach to care and support that we're providing? Okay, so this was just to highlight in terms of the links to the Children and Families Act, a few of the specific decision making rights in an EHC plan that actually um, apply directly to disabled young people over compulsory school age rather than to their parents. So in the context of a plan, so post 16, there is the right to request an assessment to make representations about the content, to request that a particular institution is named to request a personal budget for elements of the plan and also to appeal in their own right to the first tier tribunal SEM disability about decisions related to their plan. So the right of that young person to make these decisions is subject to their capacity to do so as set out in the Mental Capacity Act and following those principles on the previous slide. So we're going to move on now in the last 10 minutes to think about some of the practical challenges. So as I mentioned earlier, We've got this huge backlog at the Court of Protection. So there were 125,000 plus cases pre uh, the pandemic. The challenge around the broad range of individuals now who fall under this legislation and statutory guidance. So we've got potentially this is this is kind of law that applies to a 16 year old with SEN a 40 year old in a coma or a 78 year old with dementia? And how do we kind of navigate the nuances of implementing this law for those different groups of people and the different needs that they might have? And the defini definition of a deprivation of liberty. So although this doesn't appear on the face of the act itself, there is an intention that it will be covered within the code of practice when that comes out. And I think it will be a really important thing for those of you um, who are going to be involved in responding to the consultation, which I would very much encourage everyone to do, um, to think about whether that definition is clear, whether it makes sense in practice and how we would be thinking about implementing. So I just wanted to share with you um, uh, a tool that we have developed in CDC um, in partnership with a number of local authority areas through um, some kind of short accelerated working group workshops at the end of um, March. We launched the tool at the beginning of June and it's available to download on our website. What you'll need to do if you want to use it in your local area, it's targeted at local authorities as a system readiness tool around liberty protection safeguards specifically. It covers all of these specific kind of themes that I've identified here. And it's very similar in its layout and the way that it works to some of the audit tools that you might have used that we've developed in the past. Um, I know we developed one for CCGs around um, the kind of the role of health in the SEND system and what that looked like around DHC plans. So it's a similar format. It's an Excel spreadsheet and it's designed to be a dynamic tool that enables local authorities to work with their partners across the local area and to action plan around the specific areas that are set out. So. In terms of leadership and accountability, we've got some prompts for implementation. And then within the tool itself, it's got some key indicators and some suggestions around the evidence you might expect to see. But the key questions that we need to be thinking about in kind of readiness for this are around, do our senior leaders and managers have that sound understanding of the key duties in the Mental Capacity Act as they relate to young people? Do they have a sound understanding of the duties around the liberty protection safeguards? Have the children's social care strategic managers, including the disco role where you have that in your local area, worked with their partners in transition and adult social care to develop and agree the Liberty Protect, uh, sorry, the Liberty Protection Safeguard strategy and the implementation plan? And does it clearly define that strategic vision, objectives and outcomes in relation to young people? In a lot of the areas that we're talking to at the moment, the focus of that implementation plan is very much on adults, um, adults input. And then to what extent are social care leaders aware of their areas of strengths and areas for development around this? So the audit tool can be used as part of that process. In terms of thinking about the identification of children and young people who are being deprived of their liberty, we've put together just a short graphic that kind of sets out some of the key things to think about. So the what at the top is kind of going to be taking that definition um, from the, the code. But actually, we've got a fairly good idea at the moment around what a restriction versus a deprivation looks like. We're thinking about children and young people who are aged 16 and 17 who lack or may lack capacity under the Mental Capacity Act and thinking about where 
those children are and what data and information we have around those children at the moment. So where they might be. So we've got residential settings, including school and colleges. We've got day, day settings, schools and colleges, short break and community settings and domestic settings, including family homes. And then where might some of this data and information be about children and young people who are currently being restricted or deprived of their liberty? So we've got education, health and care plans, early help and short break plans, child in need plans, child protection plans, looked after children's plans and transition plans. But there might also be a whole range of other plans held in kind of partner organisations outside of the local authority um, who might also have um, information uh, to share around, um, around this data. So it's really important to be having those conversations. So definitely just note in the chat around children, young people in receipt of care package support with complex health needs, Definitely. So any of those where we think that there may not be join up here, it'd be really important to be having, again, some of those conversations. And I su suspect for some areas who came together very quickly at the beginning of the, the kind of lockdowns to identify their kind of very complex and, and vulnerable uh, children and young people actually might be a really good starting place to think about these data sets and, and who we're thinking about in this context. So then we've got a theme around information and awareness raising. So thinking about actually are the children and young people's workforce aware of mental capacity, aware of the liberty protection safeguards and least restrictive practice in general? Are we having those conversations as part of annual reviews? And is there accessible information about the liberty protection safeguards available to young people and families on the local offer via the Sendias services? And how do we link into those things and share what that means in the context of each agency's work? And we've then got assessments and plans. So is information and conversations about young people's rights, the least restric restrictive principle of the Mental Capacity Act, built into planning and review meetings with families? Are we having these conversations? Are we thinking about what that means for young people's independence and for having that parallel plan in mind that even where we've had a deprivation authorised through either the court protection or the liberty protection safeguards as we move forward, do we have a clear process for review and for thinking about what we can do to support that care and support to happen in a less restrictive way? Is there currently a clear and transparent process for assessing the capacity of young people aged 16 and 17? And are your children's workforce and your transition workforce really clear on what that process is? Is there a process in place for requesting advocacy, whether that's an IMCA, whether that's a, a, an approved mental capacity professional under the new um, Amendment Act? And are there clear protocols for establishing where the liberty protection safeguards is the appropriate and proportionate response for young people and where more complex situations may require further scrutiny? So this could be an example um, of where we might have a young person who has behaviour that challenges and actually work is happening around understanding whether uh, a deprivation might be in place, whether it's in the best interest of the young person for that deprivation of liberty to be in place or whether that might be uh, in the interest of of others involved in their care and support, which might be a perfectly understandable situation to be in, but actually we need to then take a different approach to how we how we provide that care and support and how we make those arrangements. And then finally on these, just thinking about uh, the kind of workforce development needs and do the workforce supporting children and young people from year nine onwards understand much more explicitly the principles of supported decision making, the definition, of deprivation of liberty and when to involve the court of protection and the least restrictive approaches and practices and the post-16 workforce, do they understand and apply those principles of the Mental Capacity Act and the liberty protection safeguards as appropriate in full? Um, so there are a few more slides I've got here and I'm conscious of the time. I didn't include all of them with the intention of being able to go through them, but really with the intention of having some additional information in the slide pack when it comes out to everyone afterwards. Um, uh, there's a couple of notes in the chat box and I've just noticed that my colleague Deborah has really helpfully put the link to the evaluation of today's session. I think I just want to caveat this with there is a huge amount of information that is going to be coming out imminently on this. So we've got your information and the fact that you've registered kind of an interest in this topic. So we'll make sure that as we hear about information about the code of practice and the consultation, that that also gets shared with everyone who will receive the slides from today's session. 
but I'm just noting that if anyone's got any questions that they would like to pop in the chat box, I'm happy to pick them up outside of the session and, and respond as part of kind of an FAQ uh, with the materials that come out. But equally, if anyone would want to email me after the session with anything they take back to their local area, please do. The links to the um, system readiness tool will also be in the materials that come out. So the way that that system works is that there's a, a kind of a requirement to submit data from the tool as we go through so that we can start to build a national picture of readiness to help inform DfE and DHSC on the type of support that the children's workforce will need around implementation. So there's a memorandum of understanding that you can download from the website that needs to be um, that needs to be signed uh, at DCS level. And you will then be able to access uh, the tool and to be able to, to, to do that work from there. Um, so the few questions that are coming in the chat, I'm not going to attempt to answer them now, but I will make sure that I pick those up. We'll copy the chat and make sure that they come out in an FAQ to you. Um, it may not come out immediately with the um, the uh, slides from the session just because um, I'm unfortunately going on annual leave from Friday. But I will make sure that very quickly on my return, I get the FAQ pulled together and sends that out. Um, so, yeah, I'll pick up all of those issues around advocates, who are the responsible people, how do we bring those together? And I will also bring in some of those points that were raised about the case law as well. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Hope this has been useful. It really has been a very much a whistle stop tour of what we know about the system at the moment. But hopefully, if any of you are interested in downloading the, the tool, that will give you much more of the detail around things to be thinking about in local areas with your partners. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.